Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, dignitaries, students, alumni, one and all. On behalf of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, I feel privileged to welcome you all to Padma Bhushan, Dr. P. R. Dubashi Public Lecture. I now request the dignitaries, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, Dr. Ajit Ranade, Ambassador Gautam Bambavale, and daughter of late Padma Bhushan, Dr. Pia Dubashi, Dr. Meeta Dubashi, to kindly take their places on the dais. I now request Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade, to welcome the Chief Speaker of today's function, Ambassador Gautam Bambavale, with a bouquet of flowers. I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor to welcome the guest of honor, Daughter of late Padma Bhushan, Dr. Pia Dubashi, Dr. Meeta Dubashi, with a bouquet of flowers. I now request Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade who is chairing the function to make his opening remarks on the Padma Bhushan, Dr. Pia Dubashi lecture and take over the function. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon and namaskar to all. <coughs> and thank you, Jaleen, for, uh, for the opening up the, opening the ceremonies. So my name is Ajit Ranade and I join my colleagues at the Institute uh, in welcoming, uh, extending a very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, uh, Dubashi lecture, our annual, one of our big annual uh, event uh, in our calendar. So um, <coughs> allow me to say a little bit about the lecture series itself. I think this is the 13th lecture in the series that we are uh, holding today. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, Mr. Dubashi, but before that, let me tell you that uh, this lecture today uh, is part of a series which started in uh, 2006, and we've been, we've been holding it, uh, as I said, annually, once every year, and uh, we've had some very distinguished speakers uh, in the past as part of this series, distinguished speaker today. Uh, typically, it is held on, uh, I think, March 7th every year, uh, but you know, owing to some pan uh, COVID disruptions and you know, a little bit of adjustment, uh, we are ha having it slightly later. Uh, Mr. Dubashi, uh, or Dr. P.R. Dubashi, uh, many of you know about him, and an excellent, first of all, an excellent academic and a brilliant career in terms of the academic sense. He, in 1946, uh, he stood first in what was called the matriculation examination in Bombay province. Uh, he obtained his MA from Pune University and then a PhD and then a DLIT, Doctor of Literature. He was also awarded the postgraduate diploma in Economic and Social Administration uh, by the famous London School of Economics, where he studied as the British Council Scholar. So he's, you know, to begin with as a scholar and as an academic, his career was brilliant. Uh, he joined the Indian Ancestry Service. He was a IAS uh, officer, and he served for 35 years in IAS in various capacities uh, across the nation. Uh, in that administrative career, uh, career he served um, several assignments in various, uh, you know, I'm not going to list all of them, but for example, like divisional commissioner or secretary in state in Indian government in, in policy making level. And uh, of course, uh, he also headed, he had major contributions to national institutions, especially in training and research uh, and human resource development 
in various sectors. Um, after his retirement from the IAS, he uh, was invited to be the vice chancellor of uh, Goa University and uh, where he built a brand new campus and in fact left a very strong mark in, in that uh, university. I think if you if you visit if you had a chance to visit Goa University, you will see the very distinguished uh, distinguished uh, impact that he had. He was not only a, an illustrious administrator, but also a social scientist in action. And what he said is that you know he related thinking to action and action to thinking, uh, and it's reflected. As I said, he had a very scholarly career, uh, so it's reflected in his 25 books. He wrote, uh, in fact, several books, both in English and Marathi, and uh, also various papers, including academic papers, on various facets, not just public administration, but the developmental issues uh, across the board. He uh, also served on uh, other in, in boards of other institutions like NABARD, or expert committees on rural finance, and he was chair of the Committee on Management of Institutes appointed by the Pune University. Uh, of course, you know, the, uh, he received many prizes, was awarded many prizes by Government of India. And uh, among them, I would like to mention, for example, as early as 1960 he, uh, and 61, he won, he got the uh, best essay award from uh, Pandit Nehru, Prime Minister Nehru, uh, awarded by the Indian Institute of Public Administration. Then he received the Shiromani Award, the Ganesh Saraswati Thakur Desai Award in 1998-99 the Loka Hitavadi Gopal Hari Deshmukh Award in 2006. Then he was given the Padma Bhushan by Government of India in uh, 2010, and Republic Day 2010. He also served as Chairman of the Pune Kendra of Bharti Vidya Bhavan. So today's lecture, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is in memory of Dr. P. R. Dubashi, and I thank the family. I especially thank Ms. Uh, Dr. Meera Dubashi uh, for this kind gesture and a privilege and honor for us to host this every year. I now turn uh, to our speaker for today. Uh, he is, um, I mean, I, I, I have to confess, and I hope you won't mind, he's also a very close friend. And uh, <coughs> uh, he's a Pune, Punekar now. Uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambavale was a member of the Indian Foreign Service from 1984 to 2018. He was ambassador to Bhutan, Pakistan, and China. He was also stationed in Washington, D.C. Uh, during 2004 to 2007. If you remember, that was the time when India and U.S. signed a historic nuclear deal, civil nuclear deal, uh, by which India was brought out of the nuclear apartheid, which India had suffered this for 30 years. It was a very historic deal, and he was in Washington as, as uh, in the, I guess, in the center of action during those days. Uh, this, this deal, by the way, transformed the relationship between the two countries. He has also been India's first consul general in Guangzhou province in China from 2007 to 2009. India has several consular offices. Guangzhou was opened uh, newly, I guess, and he was the first consul general uh, in Guangzhou. He was director of the Indian Cultural Center in Berlin from 1994 to 1998. He also served in the prime minister's office in 2002 to 2004. And at the Ministry of External Affairs, you know, the foreign office people, foreign service people, they spend time abroad, then they're brought back, you know, onshore, offshore duties. So when he was back in Delhi, he was uh, in the MEA, Ministry of External Affairs, uh, as Joint Secretary for East Asia from 2009 to 2014. That's almost five years. I guess that was the time when India signed the historic uh, free trade agreement with uh, ASEAN, 2010. So he was, I'm sure, instrumental in that. And... Uh, and the whole Look East policy, which started in the, I guess, uh, mid-1990s, was, was gaining momentum around that time. And uh, most importantly, uh, Gautam Bamawale uh, has dealt with China for 15 of his 34 years of diplomatic career. After that, also he's been very active after retirement. Uh, I'm, uh, I can uh, proudly say I'm fortunate to be a co-author with a book which was written right after the Ladakh incident, and we mulled over it. Uh, so it's written by six authors. It's called Rising to the China Challenge. It was published, I think, in September or October 2021. So just a few months back. And within a month uh, of that, or uh, two months of that, 
I'm, I'm proud to say that we won uh, a Litfest Award for uh, best book on geopolitics. So <laughs> the credit goes to him, not to me. <laughs> I, I happen to be one of the co-authors. Please have a look. Uh, please read the book if you can, because it's very, I think, very uh, written in a very lucid style and gives, of course, this situation is evolving uh, you know, very, very rapidly and vol in a very volatile way. But uh, rising to the China challenge captures the the essence, that is, we are not trying to defeat China, we are not trying to <laughs> beat China, we are not trying to, but rising to the China, China poses a challenge to the to, to India. Uh, I'm not trying to steal from his speech, but uh, if you really want uh, uh, one of the leading, I would say the most leading specialist on China in India, we are lucky to have uh, Gautam Bhammawala, and he's also in Pune, as I said. Uh, he's currently a distinguished professor of um, faculty of humanities and social sciences in Symbiosis International University. You must have heard of symbiosis, right? Okay. Uh, we are hoping that uh, very soon uh, he will have more formal association uh, with a more illustrious university in the neighborhood. Where we <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I need to light a wind. Anyway, he's also a senior advisor to OLA, and he's a trustee of the Pune International Center, which recently celebrated uh, 10 years, 10th anniversary. But all this is, is really nothing. Most importantly, he is an alumnus of Gokhale Institute. So uh, <coughs> we are very proud and privileged to have Mr. Gautam Bambawale deliver the Subhashi lecture for 2022. Please, welcome. making sure that all of you can hear me at the back there. Dr. Ajit Ranade, Vice Chancellor, Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, relatives and family members of the late Dr. P. R. Dubashi, particularly Dr. Medha Dubashi, Professor V. S. Chitre, former director of the Gokhale Institute, Professor Rajas Parsure, also a former director of the institute, members of the faculty of Gokhale Institute, and dear students. It is a privilege and honor for me to deliver the Dr. P. R. Dubashi public lecture for 2022. As you all know, and you just heard about it from the vice chancellor, Dr. Dubashi was a brilliant mind from Pune who worked in the Indian Administrative Service, or IAS, over a career of 35 years. He held many important positions during this period and distinguished himself as an administrator. What I find even more impressive is that even after he retired from government service from the IAS, Dr. Dubashi continued to work on several government committees. He worked as an academician. He was for a long period vice chancellor of Goa University, particularly in his formative years. He also has 27 books to his credit on various subjects in both English as well as in Marathi. I've just written my first book along with Dr. Ranade, so I have 26 more to go. As a civil servant who worked in the Indian Foreign Service for 34 years, I can share with you all that one of the challenges that we face in the civil service is to retain our inquisitive mind and freshness of thought over a career which spans three decades or more. Obviously, Dr. Dubashi did this very, very successfully and I will consider myself fortunate if I am able to emulate him and contribute some original ideas and thinking over the next few years of my life as a former civil servant. I'm also delighted that this public lecture is taking place at the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, which as you all heard is my alma mater. I studied here from 1978 to 1981, 
And as I look out over the audience, I am particularly fortunate to see many of my friends, my batchmates uh, from those formative years. They obviously contributed to the man I have become, and I intend to continue to have discussions, confabulations, perhaps even arguments with them in the coming years on topics of national and international importance. So friends and classmates or former classmates, if we are able to do this, perhaps all of us will retain the quickness of perception as well as the clarity of thought that Dr. Zubashi was famous for. What in my view is a significant characteristic of Gokhale Institute is that whether it was Dr. D.R. Gadgil or Dr. V.M. Dandekar or Dr. V.S. Chitre or Dr. Ajit Ranade, this institution has always understood and laid emphasis on the symbiotic relationship between economics on the one hand and politics on the other. Even if it is mainly a center of excellence for the research and study of economics, people here never forget the close linkage between politics and economics. I would venture to guess, I would venture to guess that Dr. P. R. Dubashi, like me, would have admired this trait of Gokhale Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic that I chose for today's lecture touches upon both geopolitics as well as geoeconomics. It has much to do with what is happening in the world today, what the emerging trends of a new world order look like, and how India can and should position itself with a view to maximizing our own national interests. As all of you know, one of the most significant international developments of the past few weeks has of course been what has occurred in Ukraine. The West keeps saying that Ukraine has been invaded by Russia. On the other hand, the Russians say that they are conducting a special military operation in Ukraine. While there is truth in the fact that Ukraine gained its independence about four decades ago and has indeed been recognized by other nations across the globe as a sovereign independent country with its own place in the United Nations. There is also great significance in the Russian argument that they had over several years warned the West that Moscow could not just sit back and watch the eastward expansion of NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Putin had clearly warned in no uncertain terms that Russia would not tolerate its neighboring countries like Georgia and Ukraine becoming a part of NATO. The Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, keeps arguing Russia cannot just watch neighbors become members of a Western military alliance and have US missiles located in those countries aimed at Russia. When this threat to Russia seemed to be close to materializing, Moscow took military action against Ukraine. Friends, this is what great powers do. Let me give you an example from India's own neighborhood. If missiles aimed at, at us were to be placed in a country to our north or south by a third country, how do you think India will respond? I know the answer, but I'm not going to say it out here. I'm going to let all of you ponder on this question. At the same time, India has been concerned by Russia's action against a smaller, less powerful, but independent nation. These actions have clearly infringed Ukraine's national sovereignty as well as its territorial integrity. Therefore, India has had to carefully weigh the fact that Russia, as well as its predecessor state, the Soviet Union, 
which had a very special relationship with India, and that covers not merely military hardware, but it also covers nuclear commerce and space cooperation. In all three areas, India has gained immeasurably from Russia, who has been our friend over the long term. How the then Soviet Union backed us to the hilt during the Bangladesh crisis of 1971 will be well known to the older members of this audience. Perhaps the younger ones were not born at that time. But it is very well known that the Soviet Union backed us to the hilt during the Bangladesh operations of 1971. Today, our relationship with Russia has another very important component, namely oil and gas, of which we import a fair amount from Moscow. So, ladies and gentlemen, all these facets had to be weighed together very carefully and in a calibrated manner when India had to vote on the Ukraine issue at the United Nations, both in the UN Security Council as well as at the UN General Assembly. And as all of you know, India is a member of the UN Security Council, a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for the period 2021-2022. However, even though India abstained in all three votes, at the Security Council twice and at the General Assembly once, we also simultaneously issued fairly lengthy explanations of vote, which clearly brought out our anguish over Russia's moves. I would suggest to all of you that you please do read these explanations of vote carefully. They're available online. You just have to Google it and you'll find it very easily. Moreover, Prime Minister Modi himself has repeatedly called for a halt to bloodshed so as to give dialogue and diplomacy a chance to resolve the issues between Ukraine and Russia peacefully. Friends, there are many ordinary people in India who ask, how is it that India has not condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine? The answer lies in the fact that the truth is not so clear-cut and not that easy. It is a many-layered thing. And in taking its position at the UN Security Council, as well as at the UN General Assembly, India had to weigh its own national interests, given the many facets of the Ukraine crisis. Our national interests were best served by abstaining on the resolutions which were up for a vote. What I would like to highlight to all of you today is that where international affairs are concerned, India takes its own position based on the facts and the merits of the case so as to ensure that Indian interests are taken care of. Wasn't this described as non-alignment in the past? Today, we refer to it as strategic autonomy. Whatever the nomenclature, and that doesn't matter, the name or the title, the nomenclature doesn't really matter. Incidentally, other big powers are not averse to attempt arm twisting in order to make India take a decision which is favorable to them on issues such as Ukraine. Over the decades, India has become adept at recognizing such moves at arm twisting but arriving at decisions which are not dictated by others. The more powerful India becomes, the less will attempted arm twisting be of any significance to us. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two other points I would like to make on the Ukraine matter. The first is that while the West has come to Ukraine's help by levying economic sanctions on Russia, and selling arms and equipment to Kiev. What is significant is that no country whatsoever has sent troops to fight on behalf of Ukraine. Recently, there are news reports of both sides, Russia and Ukraine, resorting to the use of mercenaries in this conflict. I'm afraid that this will only muddy matters even more. But what is important is that the lesson that India should draw from these events 
is that if push comes to shove, we ourselves will be alone in a fight with any of our enemies. This was also amply clear over the last two years on our Ladakh frontier, when the Chinese attempted to make major changes to the status quo on the ground. It was the Indian military which thwarted China. The lesson from all this is that India needs to grow more powerful and enhance its comprehensive national power in order to protect itself. The second but related aspect that I would like to highlight is that when major powers take important geopolitical or geoeconomic decisions, they are not likely to be deterred by economic sanctions which may be levied by other countries. They are willing to undergo short-term pain in order to ensure longer-term gain. When India herself undertook its nuclear tests in 1998, we too were sanctioned by the West as well as by China. But that did not deter us from our decision to go overtly nuclear, and we did indeed endure short-term pain. I make this point because I shall revert to it when discussing the China challenge that India faces. One last aspect, one last point of the Russia-Ukraine imbroglio, which I would like to highlight, is that perhaps there are some opportunities for India in what is a dismal situation. I do not mean that we should fish in troubled waters, not at all, but at the same time, we should not ignore certain things which may be in our interest. The first is that many Western companies, particularly in the oil and gas sector, such as BP or the former British Petroleum, have resolved and decided to sell their assets in Russia. For India, which is a major oil and gas importing nation, doesn't it make sense to acquire some of these assets which may actually be sold at fairly competitive prices? In fact, in today's newspapers, you would have read that we are procuring oil from Russia at very cheap prices. I am advocating that we move a step forward and also procure the assets which Western oil companies like BP are selling in Russia. Russia herself has requested India to assist her with investment. Also keep in mind that if we don't acquire them, others will. I can definitely see China lining up to do so, but there may be other nations as well. On the Ukrainian side, perhaps some of their mathematicians, physicists, or economists may be looking to resettle elsewhere in the world. Shouldn't we try to get them to India? In this matter, we cannot wait for the government to take the lead. Perhaps Gokhale Institute can start by attracting a well-known Ukrainian economist to come teach and research here in Pune. Another aspect of the Russia-Ukraine situation which we cannot afford to ignore is the limits of American power. One famous US scholar had termed the period after the splintering of the former Soviet Union in the early 1990s, 91, 92, and the ensuing preeminence of US power, he had described it as the end of history. This is a person called Francis Fukuyama. Well, since the early 1990s, and particularly after the disastrous wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, today we can clearly see that there are finite limits to American power. This is a trend of great import, even though the United States continues today to remain the preeminent military power in the world. Trends, the other major trend in geopolitics is of course the rise of China. That country has experienced annual GDP growth in double digits for almost four decades. And today, she is the second largest economy in the world at $15 trillion. As experienced by other countries which have had rapid economic growth, China too is seeing simultaneous improvements in her military strength, in education facilities, in innovation, 
and in technology development. China's comprehensive national power today closely, closely rivals that of the United States. What is even more significant is that Washington clearly perceives Beijing as a peer competitor and has moved to cut her down to size. Whether the US succeed in, succeeds in this endeavor remains to be seen. China herself is also changing the international order in small but significant ways which are to her own advantage. The tussle for power has truly been joined. Now, in this fight for supremacy amongst the major powers, China and the United States, or the United States and China, most Asian nations are sitting on the fence, since that posture of sitting on the fence suits them best. Whichever of the major powers comes out victorious, Asian nation states will be well positioned to gain from that. Till 2019, India too could afford to sit on the fence without taking sides between the two major powers of the United States and China. However, this is no longer the case. Things changed dramatically in April and May of 2020 when Beijing moved large numbers of troops to the border with India at Eastern Ladakh. Let me explain why India cannot but take sides in this tussle between the two preeminent powers in the world. In December 1988, India's former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited China. It was the first visit to China by an Indian Prime Minister in over three decades. Incidentally, I happened to be stationed in Beijing at that time as a young diplomat. The agreement that emanated from that very important set of meetings between the leaders of India and China was that on the one hand, the two countries would make serious attempts at resolving their differences on the boundary and at the same time ensuring that peace and tranquility reigned in the India-China border areas. On the other hand, both governments would advance bilateral ties in other areas, including economics, culture, scientific cooperation, and technology transfer. So on the one hand, maintain peace on the border. On the other, let economics, culture, scientific cooperation move ahead. In the pursuing years after that path-breaking visit, the governments of India and China concluded several agreements aimed at ensuring that the India-China border was peaceful. So from 1988, when Rajiv Gandhi visited Beijing, to 2019, the template in which the bilateral relationship functioned was that on the one hand, the border would be kept peaceful, while on the other, trade, commerce, and other cooperative activity would be permitted to move ahead smoothly. As a result, bilateral trade grew exponentially, and by 2019, China enjoyed a huge surplus vis-a-vis -vis India. So China did benefit enormously from its relationship with India. Then in April 2020, China suddenly moved large numbers of troops to the border in Eastern Ladakh. They moved more than two divisions of soldiers, implying anywhere from 50 to 60,000 soldiers. Remember that by Beijing and New Delhi. Hence, this movement of troops itself was a violation of all those agreements. China violated all those agreements by moving these troops. India, of course, reacted by bringing equally large numbers of troops to Eastern Ladakh. We too moved about 50 to 60,000 troops, several divisions of troops. But this created the problem at Galwan, where on the night of 15 June 2020, several soldiers and military officers from both sides were killed in action. This was the first such loss of life on the India-China border in over three decades. It was a very serious incident indeed. Now remember, it was China and its leadership which decided to give up the template of the past of maintaining peace on the India-China border. 
it was the Chinese and their leadership who decided to take the risky step of bringing in large numbers of troops. India was only reacting in order to protect its own territorial integrity. Hence, the onus of the present situation on the India-China border lies entirely with China. Let us spend a few moments analyzing why China may have decided to break with the past, to break with ensuring peace on the border, and why did it move large numbers of troops to eastern Ladakh? In my view, there are two main reasons for China to do this. One is a tactical reason, the other is more strategic. The tactical reason is that China wanted to occupy at least some territory which it claimed as its own, but which it did not have control over or which it did not have control of. This kind of situation does exist in pockets of the India-China boundary. Let me share with you that at best, China may have gained control of a few square kilometers of land through its military actions in the summer of 2020. Indeed, there are certain patrolling points and patrolling routes which the Indian Army used to go up to in the past and which we are not able to do at present. However, for these minor tactical gains on the ground, China has lost India from a strategic perspective. China's actions over these past two years has moved India immeasurably closer to the United States. It has also moved India closer to Japan and Australia. The second important reason, the strategic reason, that China undertook the action she did in Eastern Ladakh is to show to India, to show the rest of Asia, and to show the world at large that she, China, is the big power in this part of the globe. In other words, China is the hegemon in Asia, and other nation states must acknowledge it and must acknowledge this fact. India has definitely not accepted this proposition and neither have many other countries of Asia. As all of you will readily acknowledge, China's actions have spurred the development and growth of the Quad or the Quadrilateral Security Initiative, which groups together the four nations of India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. The speed at which the Quad has grown to be a leaders-led forum indicates how countries are reacting to Chinese heavy-handedness and outright muscle flexing, not merely on the India-China border, but also in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Straits, in the Senkaku Islands, which are claimed by Japan, and its attempted economic arm twisting of Australia. Even the concept of the Indo-Pacific is mainly a geostrategic construct aimed at reining in China's territorial ambitions. However, as I have argued earlier, and I think you must have heard me loud and clear, we shall have to fight off China on our own. We shall get diplomatic support and perhaps also armaments from the United States and the West, but they will not ever send soldiers to our borders. If looked at from their perspective, this position is quite obvious because it is in their national interest not to send soldiers. Neither should we expect them to send soldiers and neither should we want it. However, we must realize that we need to build India's military strength as well as our economic strength. They both go hand in hand. One will not sustain without the other. Therefore, India needs to put its head down and ensure that we achieve high rates of GDP growth over an extended period of time. I would submit that we require 7 to 8% annual growth over a period of 20 to 25 years. Along with such rapid development, we will also need to enhance our spending on defense and military preparedness, which currently is roughly 1.2% of GDP I advocate raising it to about 2% of GDP. 
However, ladies and gentlemen, let me now get back to the India and China story. China's reaction to the border shenanigans has been to argue that border issues should be kept separate from trade, commerce, and economic interaction. Naturally, they would argue so, since they benefit tremendously from it. They have an annual positive trade balance with India to the tune of 60 billion US dollars. Why would they want to lose that? On the other hand, India has been arguing that if there can be no peace on our borders, then the rest of the India-China relationship cannot but be negatively impacted. And this includes trade and commerce. Over the past two years, apart from periodic military level meetings on the Ladakh frontier, which you probably read about in our newspaper, on the front pages of our newspapers, and some few interactions between the foreign ministers of India and China, all other India-China bilateral interaction between the two governments, at least, has been frozen. Trade may have increased in 2021, but that is entirely due to the rebound in global commerce after the disastrous, disastrous pandemic year of 2020. So you'll find that most countries have found that their total trade has increased in 2021 as compared to 2020. And the same thing is reflected in India-China bilateral trade. But there can be no doubt, and there is no doubt, that relations between India and China have deteriorated dramatically since 2019. And as I said earlier, the blame rests largely on China. Now, what does India do to signal its unhappiness with China? The answer is quite simple. While we maintain our military strength on the border, we have to hit where it matters and that is in the purse. This is the reason why the government of India has banned several Chinese apps from the large India market. And believe me, it has hit those firms pretty hard. This is also the reason why India has decided that Chinese companies will not participate in India's 5G trials and rollout. Being kept out of the large India telecom market is a definite setback for Chinese telecom firms such as Huawei. As an ordinary consumer, I personally have decided that I shall not buy a Vivo, an Oppo, or a Xiaomi mobile phone. I will only purchase a Samsung or an Apple phone. I would urge larger number of Indians to do so because this is one way of dis displaying your patriotism. Many of you will argue that Chinese mobile phones are cheaper than their equivalents from South Korea or the United States. And this is where the concept of accepting pain for a larger national goal comes in. Remember, I had referred to this earlier. Surely we can accept this pain in order for our country to gain in the longer run and reduce our import dependence on China. Ordinary Ukrainians are suffering massive pain but they're willing to pay the price to uphold the independence of their country and to protect its territorial integrity. Surely, we in India can also tolerate some minimum economic pain for the greater good of our nation. There are industrial sectors in India which are significantly dependent on Chinese imports. The pharma industry is one example where almost 70% of our imports of active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs comes from China. This is one sector where the government of India is actively pushing Atma Nirvarta. All of us from Pune remember how important a player, a company named Hindustan Antibiotics was in India's pharma industry. It went bust due to competition from cheap Chinese imports. Government of India is now willing to assist such firms to build up their businesses anew in order to ensure that our dependence on China, our import dependence on China, reduces. Reliable and resilient supply chains are the demand of the hour, and we will need to ensure that India becomes part of the restructured global supply chains which are forming as a result of the geopolitical and geoeconomic upheavals of the past three years. Please permit me to add just a quick word about 
the COVID-induced pandemic. I prefer to call it the Wuhan virus, although there are not many in the world who want to do so because it attracts the wrath, the anger of Beijing. The Wuhan virus has indeed been a black swan event which has contributed to the shifts which are taking place in both geoeconomics as well as geopolitics. For a country like India, there are many opportunities which are being thrown up as a result of this changing and shifting world order. We need to make full use of such opportunities rather than once again letting them bypass us. The magnificent way in which Indian vaccine producers, for example, including the Pune-based Serum Institute of India, rose to the challenges posed by this Wuhan virus-induced pandemic gives us much hope. So where do India-China relations go from here? India will not agree to let things between our two countries get better if China does not restore the status quo ante on the Ladakh frontier, and so far it hasn't. I also do not see the Chinese agreeing to do so and give up whatever minor gains they may have achieved. And therefore, unfortunately, even though I am a, a former diplomat, I predict a further deterioration in India-China ties over the coming years. If this is so, then we will need all the help and assistance we can get from other countries. As I spelt out earlier and as I told you earlier, the evolving geopolitics of the world is drawing India closer to the major democracies of the world. Not merely the United States, but also Japan, Australia, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. We will also need to work closely with Russia and Vietnam. Post the Ukraine crisis and post the problems in Ukraine, the Russia relationship presents many challenges to us in India. Mongolia and South Korea as nations which are on China's periphery will also be important to us. And India will also have to expand its ties with our own immediate neighbors such as Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, the Maldives and Mauritius. So in the coming decade, these are the challenges that Indian diplomacy and foreign policy will face. However, and this is my last point, Professor Rande, as I have argued at length before, India's own international stature will depend on how strong we are internally and domestically. That can only come with faster economic growth at home along with distributive justice. How we can achieve this faster economic growth is not for me, a diplomat, to answer. It is for all of you economists to show the way towards accomplishing this goal. Thank you for listening so patiently and thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you, Gautam, for the excellent, excellent exposition of the topic uh, India and the Emerging World Order. Uh, he covered, of course, the contemporary issues in Ukraine and Russia, but the broader context of India's challenges, in particular China. You know, he is a diplomat, but he can be extremely undiplomatic and straight, as you can see from his talk, that, uh, uh, you know, it, it leaves no, absolutely no equivocation. It is very clear what his message is. Uh, so thank you for really a very lucid exp uh, exposition. So we now have some time for... Uh, Q and A session, and uh, I think Gautam, you will take some questions. Uh, so I invite the audience and uh, especially the students uh, to pose their questions uh, and uh, try. To, uh, please identify yourself and also uh, try to be as as pointed as possible in the question. Please don't use the mic for making a speech, but we can we can uh, think about that. So uh, it's now uh, the Q and A session. Uh, part of this uh, public talk. So what I'll do is uh, we, we can have the roaming mic. Uh, so please, uh, you know, on the left side, uh, the gentleman with the glasses on his on his collar. Can you can you go first? Uh, so should we take the questions together or we can just do directly, depending on the traffic? 
Okay. So please identify yourself and ask the question. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Pushkar Lakhe from MSC Eco. So you uh, mentioned import uh, independence and uh, the importance of that. So one of the recent issues is the semiconductor shortage. And uh, related to that, the China's complete monopoly over rare earth minerals. So do you see China using it as a strategic resource against India and where, uh, how, how does India counter that? Can you hear me? That's an excellent question and very, very pertinent. Um, I spoke about reducing India's import dependence on China. So re reduce uh, imports from China. I don't believe in stopping all imports at all. Uh, you can import from South Korea or any other country in the world, but we must, for geostrategic reasons, reduce our imports out of China and reduce import dependence on China. So that's point number one. To your question on semiconductors and uh, how China uses its uh, resources, you are absolutely right. China will use it as a weapon, not merely against India, but against other countries also. And uh, uh, they are doing it. They, we have seen some things of this kind in the past, vis-a-vis um, -vis Japan and uh, South Korea also. So they will, use, they will attempt to try to use it. They will attempt to use it as a weapon. But I think, uh, you know, there are other fish to fry also. There are other countries in the world which uh, may be able to help us in, in uh, manufacture of semiconductors. And I know for a fact that uh, the government of India is giving a lot of importance to the manufacture of semiconductors here in India uh, by several uh, players in, 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 in the world. Uh, so, uh, yes, you are right. They will try to do it, but I think we can uh, face that challenge if we come to it. So, Pushkar, just to uh, add to what you asked, actually, Gautam, uh, as you know, during the year 2020, calendar year 2020, and in the month of April, May and June, especially, we had that incident, uh, and it was also the pandemic, uh, COVID year, we call it Wuhan year, Wuhan virus year. In that year, India's number one trading partner was China, during that year. The next year, which is 2021 calendar year, the number one trading partner was China by 20% more. So actually trade didn't go down, but it went up. Uh, but despite that, so if I could just a very brief follow-up question, uh, Gautam, that uh, especially in areas like pharmaceuticals, which are very crucial for India's healthcare, uh, and you know even things like paracetamol and, and uh, penicillin, dependence on China is very high. We're not even talking about very fancy drugs like cancer drugs. Uh, are you advocating that we disconnect from China when 60% of our APIs are coming from? So let me start by saying that, uh, you know, I think I would not take, I thought I, I covered that in my talk by saying that 2021 is an atypical year because of the rebound in global commerce. Every country finds that its trade with every other country has increased. So I wouldn't take the uh, large uh, trade with China in 2021 as something very important. Secondly, I don't think this is true of all economists because I know that many of them are, they think on the long term, but uh, I don't uh, look at a one year perspective, I look at a 10 year perspective. And my gut feeling, my uh, prediction is that if you look at a 10 year perspective starting 2020 and see as it materializes, you will find that our dependence on imports from China will be coming down. Now, uh, uh, you spoke about the health sector, you spoke about APIs. I, I think, uh, you know, there is already a move to uh, ensure that large numbers of APIs are manufactured here in India. And you'll see all that coming on stream in a two, three, four, five year perspective. So, uh, in, in if you look at a 10 year perspective, starting April of 2020 or starting 2020, you will find a huge difference in uh, the nature of trade between India and China. Thank you. So, uh, next question, yeah, on the right, blue shirt, yeah. Can you please give the mic to, please identify yourself and uh, ask the question. 
If you just uh, say it loudly, I'll convey the question to Gautam. Yeah. Yes. What's so, your name? Uh, my name is Rana. I'm Rana, a PSC yeah. economics student from St. Basis School of Economics. Yeah. And I wanted to ask that will the countries like US or the Quad support India in fighting China if India continues its harmo harmonious relationships with Russia? So like does India need to choose between the US or the Russia? So he, the you got the question. Right? I got the question. A very good question. Uh, be expected from a student of symbiosis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not biting the be expected yeah. from students of Gokhale Institute also. Uh, no, a very good question. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. We, uh, this, uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, between Russia and Ukraine has come, to, uh, come at us at a wrong time and a difficult time because uh, our position on Ukraine uh, in international uh, fora, including at the United Nations, is uh, something which will put the Western nations off. Definitely it has put off the United States, uh, the UK, etc. But you know, I think India is nimble enough um, to be able to uh, navigate between these choppy waters. So I have a feeling that we will come out on top. We will satisfy Russia and we will also satisfy the United States and the West. The key is going to be whether, uh, you know, we are buying these S-400 missiles from Russia. So far, the Americans are saying they will not levy sanctions on us, but let's see how it goes. Um, there are already voices in the United States saying that, look, after what they have done, what India has done vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia and Ukraine, we must levy sanctions. But my gut feeling is that we'll be able to navigate these choppy waters, we will be able to come out in front and not have sanctions on, uh, on India from the West, and yet keep Russia happy. So that's what I think. Uh, because I have a great uh, belief in, uh, you know, the, uh, the way that Indian people can uh, navigate these difficult issues and difficult situations. That was a somewhat uh, diplomatic answer, but uh, we'll take it. Uh, this was a tough question. So, uh, allow me just, before we come to this uh, question, allow me just to elaborate, if you may, Gautam, for a minute or so. So people are very perplexed uh, that why is India, this is such an obvious, you know, Russia is invading Ukraine, it's, uh, it's violating the sovereignty of a country. Why is there such a doubt, you know, why should we even not condemn this? But, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and then people are using it to basically, you know, we haven't mentioned the government of the day, but basically people pro-Modi and anti-Modi people are using it as an opportunity. But actually you have to look at India's record for the last 75 years, starting with 1956, when the Russians invaded Hungary, uh, India's Prime Minister was Nehru, who, who was actually, in fact, even believed in the morality of uh, diplomacy. He was silent. 1968, uh, Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, not Nehru now, she also believed uh, in, you know, but India was silent. Uh, then I think 1979, uh, Russia invades Afghanistan, USSR invades Afghanistan, and it was uh, Charan Singh who was the Prime Minister of India. Again, India was silent. Uh, then it was, uh, I think, Vajpayee's time, Prime Minister Vajpayee's time. Uh, this was perhaps the Iraq situation. You know, uh, there was so much pressure. His own Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Adwani, there was so much pressure on to ally with the Americans. Ms. President Bush said, you are with us or against us. So India was under the pressure, ki, Chalo, yaar, we can't be neutral in this. And yet, Prime Minister Vajpayee, uh, he, you know, they had the wisdom to remain, in a, to remain uh, neutral. And then, then 2014, in March, before Mr. Modi became Prime Minister, Russia invaded Crimea, or is it Crimea? In Crimea, it was a crime anyway. Crimea. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh chose to be silent. So it's not as if only Modi government. Every government of every flavor has chosen to be silent because we have to look at our self-interest. Uh, so I think, you know, in that sense, the uh, fact that, but it's a good question that will the Russia, will the Americans use the Russia, not condemning Russia as a penalty against us? We'll wait to see. Sorry, a question. Let me also say that uh, even if they impose some kind of penalty or sanctions, I don't think India is going to collapse or anything. We will continue. We saw it in 1998, all of us 
I don't know how many of you were Both. old Both. enough, but Both. some of us were. Both. But the people said that the Indian economy will collapse if we test our nuclear weapons and the sanctions are levied by the West. But we did test our nuclear weapons. And we did have sanctions levied against us. And we still came out uh, pretty well. So I think there's a lot of, uh, I mean, the Indian economy today is, and India itself today is different from the India of 1998. And I think we have much more confidence today of That's coming right. out uh, despite all these, you know, choppy waters as I call them. Absolutely. And by the way, 1956, Mr. Nehru was silent on Hungary, but he was extremely critical of the British and French uh, taking over the Suez Canal from the Egyptians. So it's not, not as if India was silent. And in and, and, and 1971, uh, the genocide that was going on from West Pakistan to East Pakistan, Mr. Nixon and the Americans were completely silent about the genocide. And when Indians entered Bangladesh, uh, sorry, East Pakistan territory, they they brought they sent the seventh fleet, the entire naval you know power. So there's been a lot of duplicity in in the American uh, treatment of India. Anyway, but let's please go ahead. This, yeah, question. So, so I'm Bangladesh I'm from I'm from the Nepal University of this institute was a part for the longest time. Okay. So. Uh, uh, and because the distinguished speaker was in China, I spent many years there, etc. So I was just wondering if this falls within the scope of your presentation and this session of China was right. Then uh, you may want to answer this question, which is that, you know, in the way back in the late 1940s, when we both started our journeys, China and India, China was then in an even worse position than India. It had been cannibalized by so many different countries. Better to have one master, etc. And you know the story. And so, since then, they have moved way, way ahead of us. It's true we have democracy. I completely agree. It's like the famous Diva dialogue, very past mark. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great argument. But other than that, in education, you said, you said we should include Ukrainian social scientists. Our best minds are still running away from this country. Why the Ukrainians will come? The point is, whether you look at education, whether you look at the economy, whichever way you look at it, they have moved way, way ahead of us. What do you think is the reason? So, uh, Gautam, before you answer the question, for the benefit of people at the back, I'll repeat because the mic wasn't working. So, Mr. Kulkarni, right? Uh, yeah. From the well known university next door. Okay. Uh, his question was that, in the, I think you said 19, uh, earlier years, 40s or 50s, India and China were pretty much on par, right? And then the Chinese have gone far ahead. In fact, in every conceivable dimension, whether it is economy, whether it is technology, whether it's education, whether it's uh, human development indicators, and so on and so forth. And he's saying that uh, while it's appreciated when you said, let us try to examine whether Euro Ukrainian scientists can come to India, you know, whether we can benefit from that. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of Indian talent is actually going abroad. That's what. It, so that was his question. So what's your reaction? So I thought the question was that why is China ahead of India? Yeah. So, so there are several books which have been written on that. And if I start answering that question, it will end up in a book. But to try to, uh, you know, to try to encapsulate everything, uh, we all know that over a 40 year period from 1978, uh, right up till, say, 2018, uh, China grew at an average annual rate of 10, a GDP growth of 10% plus. It was double-digit uh, growth if you average it out. Uh, and that was the big difference. Now, India has not been growing at those rates, obviously. Uh, perhaps we may not be able to grow at those rates for whatever reasons, but we must try to uh, grow at about 7 or 8% per annum which we have done in the past in a few years and for an extended period of time of 15 to 20 years, maybe 25 years. So that's what I have been uh, recommending, that's what I had in my, uh, in, in, in my uh, speech. Now, um, uh, why it is so is, is, is a, it's a long story and it, it, it will not just be one lecture, it will be like a hundred lectures. So I, I don't want to go into all those details right now, but it has been documented well in several books which have been written on this subject. Uh, but at the same time, I feel that India has its own advantages. Uh, you know, Ma mere paas hai, democracy mere paas hai, is not an excuse for not growing fast. 
but it is definitely not an excuse for being uh, uh, not being confident of yourself. Uh, and uh, and I believe that today India has the confidence to grow at seven or eight uh, percent. Uh, all of us need to put our heads together to uh, you know to show the way forward. I don't think all the uh, wisdom is in the hands of the government of the day. Uh, people like all of us uh, at Gokhale Institute and other institutions across India must also give our inputs uh, to the policy makers. So uh, maybe that, uh, I don't know if I've answered the question, but those are my, some of my thoughts on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. It also shows the power of compounding, by the way. The fact is that India's growth rate also over the same 30 years is close to 7%, if I'm not, or 6.9 or something. So the power of compounding, you know, just one percentage higher if we had growth, it would have made a big difference. So, you know, when people say, Are India ka growth is 5% this year, cash or cash for 5 or 6, 1%. But 1% is a lot, 1% uh, and consistently having that extra, ex 1 or 2% extra growth. You know, the India and China, as you said, per capita income was, was similar. But oh, the power of compounding is such that just 1 or 2% extra. And that's very much in the do in the doable, you know, it's not a pipe dream. It's that one or two percent extra growth is very much in the realm of the doable. Yeah, sorry. I'm Dr. Ashwin Bandi. Uh, Ukraine and Russia actually contribute almost 25 percent of the world supply of steel. Wheat. Wheat. So now, uh, with the wheat prices going up and with the recent problems we had with the farmers, is it the right time to Downs and get benefit out of this whole problem. Absolutely. So the question, I, just I'll repeat for it, is, uh, 25 of, did you say 25% of the global wheat comes from Ukraine and Russia? And is this the right time with our go downs, Indian go down being full, to take advantage of high, very high wheat prices? Yes, absolutely. I think so. And I would advocate that we utilize some of our wheat, uh, you know, export more wheat if there is a demand uh, shortfall in the world. I would definitely recommend that, 100 percent. Yeah, Mayor. Can you please give the mic to Mayor? No, what you have pointed out is very, very true. But I think the main concern of Russia, uh, 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 as far as Ukraine is concerned, or even uh, some other countries like Georgia are concerned, is that they're they're right on their uh, you know they're right on their borders. They're neighbors to Russia, and Russia doesn't want NATO and Western a uh, Western military alliance to expand uh, to its borders. Um, you know, it doesn't want to see. Uh, NATO missiles or US missiles placed that close to it. So I think there's a geopolitical, geostrategic aspect to it. There may be an economic aspect to it, which you are absolutely right. There are certain portions of Ukraine, certain parts of Ukraine, which are very, very fertile. And perhaps uh, Putin has his eyes on that. I'm not 100% sure of that situation. We'll have to see how it develops over time uh, and, uh, and uh, what happens in that respect. Yeah, the lady in green. Sir, so, thank you so much for the enlightening lecture. I am Aditi, I am a student at Pune University. And uh, I had uh, an interesting link between non-conventional security areas, which could be the commerce and the trade, as we have seen, and uh, our foreign direct acquisitions. So as you said, perhaps Apple being invited to India, or Baiju's being invested by a Chinese company and running their business in India. How far do you advocate in current volatile times that this goes on? Because we all know that uh, we need more business, but which is the correct way of doing it in such war-like times? Is the so sorry, can I just uh, amplify your question? You're asking, uh, can, 
are you saying that if the Chinese choose to spare, invest in Indian companies, is that okay? Is that your question? Yes, should we go ahead with the foreign acquisition for foreign direct investments plus the war and non-conventional security angle also? So, so I think be the if we need part. FDI, is it okay to welcome Chinese FDI? Is that, no, I would, in fact, let me take up your, you know, to make it simple, let me take up your example of Baiju's, that there are certain Chinese investors in Baiju. Now, as long as they don't have a controlling interest, as long as they don't manage the company, I have no problem with that investment. So the share uh, could be changing overnight? No, shares, uh, but, but there are, there are uh, you know, there are uh, uh, sort of loopholes through which that kind of investment has to go through. So as long as they don't have a controlling interest, as long as they're not managing the companies, I have no problem with it. Uh, I want to come back to the issue which uh, was, was raised earlier about China being ahead of us. Now, you know, the, one of the things I tried to cover in my speech but may not have come out because I didn't amplify it greatly, is that when you have economic growth, then you also find that other aspects of your um, country, uh, you know, other aspects of your economy other aspects of uh, your comprehensive national power also grows with the economic growth. So your educational institutions start getting better because they get more financing, etc. Your uh, uh, innovation and innovative sort of landscape gets better. Your uh, technology uh, development landscape gets better. So it's all linked. There is a very strong correlation between all these aspects and therefore um, I utilized economic growth and economic development and faster economic growth and faster economic development as the key to success in India. As we grow economically, you will find that our military also grows faster and becomes more, more strong. You will find a lot of uh, military equipment being developed in India and you will find uh, our educational institutions, for example, also getting stronger. So. I thought I'd make that point, Rajit, uh, uh, in answer to the earlier questions. But there's some questions right at the back there. Ajit. Yeah, yeah, we'll take that. But the tricky thing is about this Chinese FBI, especially Indian tech companies. Recently, just few days back, Paytm was asked to stop operations. Paytm Bank cannot now uh, take new customers because there is a suspicion that there's a the data that they have on Indian customers is going to Chinese servers. So these are the kind of actions that China. Yeah, at the back. Uh, yes. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, in the recent times, uh, the competency of UN has been really questioned. So your opinion on it, one. Two, uh, in the recent, I feel like personally, UN is not doing a very good job by handling crisis, letting me the Syrian crisis, Yemeni crisis, letting me the UK, uh, Ukraine, Russian crisis. What changes does the UN require to uh, tackle these challenges that they're not being able to answer? What's your name? Sorry. So the question is on United Nations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's an excellent question. Uh, thank, thank you for asking it. Uh, I I will try to answer it uh, elliptically by just giving you one uh, you know of my personal anecdotes. As they say, when you grow old, you get into your anecdotage. So I'm uh, in my anecdotage right now. So uh, you know, I was working as. Um, he told you in my CV at our embassy in Washington, we were doing the nuclear deal and so on. And my colleague who used to work at the United Nations in New York, um, he called me late one evening uh, at about 8 o'clock at night and we were chatting to each other. He's a diplomat, he was a diplomat at the United Nations uh, for India. So uh, he told me, my God, it's been a very long day here at the United Nations. We've had several meetings. So my response to him was as follows. Look, what you are doing at the United Nations is the talking. What we are doing in Washington DC is the deciding. And that I think encapsulates, you know, at least my views of the United Nations, but it is an important organization. We cannot uh, get rid of it. Uh, I believe it needs to change and its representation should be um, you know, uh, it was set up, the current uh, structure of the United Nations was set up in 1945. In 2022, it's a totally different world. And the United Nations needs to be restructured to reflect this new realities of the global politics and international politics. And only then will it be a more useful, a more uh, forceful, 
and a more, uh, you know, a, a decision-making body which can carry its weight. So that's what I believe we, uh, we should uh, be doing. Thank you. But uh, would you re would you predict that uh, United Nations reform is on the agenda, and we will see a different United Nations next ten or fifth, twenty years? I am not very sure about it because those who have, uh, uh, you know, a very strong stake in the system, uh, as everywhere else, uh, those who um, uh, prefer the current structure of the United Nations are not allowing it to change. So uh, unless that changes, uh, and when that changes is anyone's guess, might take five years, might take 10 years, might take 100 years, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll take a couple of more questions. Uh, first, we'll take one, yeah, this lady at the right, yeah. Good evening, sir, how are you? Thoda loudly. Uh, so I'm Sai Vaidya from SP College. I wanted to ask uh, about Pakistan and... You Sorry, you can come forward and ask. Yeah. Now? Yeah. So, I wanted to ask about Indo-Pakistan relations and after the Ukraine invasion, it seemed that India and Pakistan have had similar concerns with the West. So, where do we see Indo-Pakistan relations in this emerging world? Thank you. Uh, For the people at the back, if you didn't hear, this question is about India-Pakistan relations and especially since you have served as uh, ambassador to Pakistan. Yeah. So, let me start by shocking you by saying that Pakistan doesn't matter to India. <laughs> we should not spend so much time on Pakistan. Um, of course, uh, I'm not saying that we should be at da daggers drawn with Pakistan. We should, you know, it is important for both the countries to be able to get on with the real questions that they face, which is how to eradicate poverty, how to get more employment for its people, how to educate its uh, young populace. They need to do it, we need to do it. So some kind of understanding between the two countries is very, very important. Unfortunately, the way Pakistan is structured, where its military calls the shots, is not conducive to this kind of understanding. If Pakistan were a true, de true democracy like ours, where the prime minister was elected and is elected, but if he would call the shots or she would call the shots, uh, I think India and Pakistan will be able to get over the problems that we have been facing over uh, the last 75 years of our existence. But because it is the Pakistan military which, uh, the, which decides, which is the main decision-making body in Pakistan on many, many issues across uh, the spectrum, uh, it's, not, it's not been possible to arrive at this kind of understanding between the two countries. But uh, there is always hope and uh, we hope that Pakistan will change, the military will have to you know, be a military similar to ours which fights when it is told to by its uh, political masters. And if that situation comes about in Pakistan, then I am very confident that the political level people leadership in both countries will be able to come to some kind of understanding where the two countries can continue to live by, side by side in peace and yet focus on uh, the really important issues which they face. So thank you for asking that question. We have many hands, but one little tidbit, uh, Gautam, for, uh, I think also for Vaidya's. Uh, the thing is that South Asia is the only region in the entire world where the intra, this is an economic tidbit, intra-region trade, you know, all other regions of the world, South America, North America, Europe, East Asia, the intra-region trade dominates. So, for example, in Europe, 80-90% of the trade is actually among Europeans. South Asia is the only region in the world which has 20 to 25% of humanity, and yet 95% of the trade is with the, is with the outside world, not with each other. So, I, I actually, I think Pakistan and Bangladesh, according to me, matter to India, but we just don't. Yeah. No, uh, what you said, Ajit, is absolutely correct because intra-South Asia trade, as all of us know, is less than 5%. It's 5% or less than 5%. Whereas intra EU trade is 60%, intra ASEAN trade is 25 to 30%. Uh, but the reason for that is, I think, because in South Asia we let our emotions rule. We let emotions decide how we will interact rather than cool, rational thinking. Uh, so we need to get over that. But also let me point out that a few years ago, uh, say about 10 years and more, where were the largest number of tourists into India originating from? From which country? They used to originate from the United States, UK, then Germany, France, etc. Today, the number one country from which uh, 
travelers or, or visitors, uh, international travelers or visitors come to India is Bangladesh. The number three country is Sri Lanka. So we are beginning to see this change, but when it, it to, for it to move into the trade and commerce area will take a little bit. It's a huge opportunity. Okay, now I have to start rationing. So we'll have to, uh, okay, the yeah, brown, yeah, maroon t-shirt, yeah. You, yeah, yes, yes, please go ahead. If you keep it brief, then we can accommodate all the questions. Maybe we want to wind up now. Sir, yeah. uh, evening, sir, Gaurav Kesri from Agri Business. Sir, I think under the Lisbon Protocol 1992 in Mazandra, I thought 1993, Ukraine and Kazakhstan decided to dismantle its nuclear power and sell it to Russia for 1 billion US dollars. So do you think if Ukraine had been a nuclear power, the situation would have been different? And do you think the nuclear weapon gives you a psychological edge in the world geopolitics? So, uh, I, I could hear it, I don't know if the others could hear it, but yes, you are absolutely right that uh, Ukraine did give up its nuclear weapons. It continued to manufacture or produce nuclear power uh, because nuclear power is green energy and therefore uh, it is better to have nuclear power or wind power or solar power rather than, you know, hydropower, not hydropower, but definitely so uh, using coal. Uh, but uh, Ukraine did give up its nuclear weapons and you cannot be more right, you're absolutely right, you have hit the nail on the head that if Ukraine had nuclear weapons today, the Russians would not have attacked them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, I am Nero Solanki from SYPSC Economics. Uh, my question for you is that, is it not racist to call it the Wuhan virus? or the China virus because like the way you frame it, the heat crime they have peaked during the COVID time. Okay. So, yeah. it, is, it is racist to call it the Wuhan virus, but it is not racist to call it the South African variant. It is racist to call it the Wuhan virus, but you will not uh, hesitate to say that Delta originated in India. So you know I am afraid I don't agree with you at all. You have, you have hit an undiplomatic nerve in it, so <laughs> you hear, no, yeah. I'm, I, no, no, I can be undiplomatic because I am retired. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. But I strongly believe that, so please, if you if you want to have a discussion, I will be happy to come to your class and talk about it. <laughs> please, uh, Ashish and Sailin note, uh, is, is yes, offered himself for a lecture. Yeah. I have one simple question. No, that's an excellent question, sir, but you hit the nail on Can the head. Can you repeat for the benefit yeah, of... Yeah, he's asking whether it would be useful to have a standing peacekeeping force of the United Nations. You know, the United Nations undertakes uh, peacekeeping operations in different parts of the world. The only problem I visualize in that is that you can have a standing peacekeeping force, but someone has to decide that it will be deployed. And that is where the problem comes. They are not able to decide whether to deploy a peacekeeping operation or a standing force. So uh, I, I think uh, you're absolutely right. It would be useful. But if they're not going to be able to make the decision in the Security Council, then we're back to square one. Okay, we'll take two more questions because, uh, yeah, the lady in black, yeah. So, uh, in this emerging world order, we talked about the West and the Here East. Is, what's your name, please? I'm Isha from FIBSC, go to uh, So, we talked about the West and the East, but we missed the African part, where the China has been making consistent investments in, uh, let it be the telecom sector, or the uh, road infrastructure and sea route infrastructure. So, how do you see the importance uh, or the role of Africa in this emerging world order? And should India uh, be more, uh, should India give a little bit more importance to that continent as well? Uh, no, you are right. You are not wrong that Africa is important and will be important, uh, maybe in a longer term perspective, 25, 30 years. Uh, and that India should continue what it's doing with Africa in terms of you know, investment, trade, etc., etc. 
uh, the only point I'd like to make is, and I come back to the point that I'd made earlier, that it's only when the Indian economy, which is currently roughly $3 trillion, uh, we spoke of the Chinese economy being $15 trillion, the American economy is $22 trillion. So when India's economy grows to 5 or 6 or $7 trillion, you'll find that we are doing much more with all the countries across the globe, including Africa. Uh, we will have the resources to be able to do much more. So uh, it will come. It is important. It's not that it is unimportant. You're absolutely right. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, time will come where we're already doing quite a lot with, uh, with Africa, but we will do much more in terms of trade and investment with Africa in, say, a 10 or 15 year perspective. Sorry, we are running out of time, so we just take one more question, uh, uh, and I'll have to pick one. Sorry, I, I, I can take only one, so maybe I'll take one from this right side. Uh, sir, my name is uh, As you know that India and some other countries uh, are trying to get position in UN Permanent Security uh, Council, and uh, we know the India's current uh, stance in uh, Ukraine and Russia crisis. So, how will uh, uh, it affect the India's uh, case? No, I don't think it will affect India's case. In any case, as we were saying earlier, restructuring of the UN, I don't know in what kind of time frame it will occur. I am quite confident that I will no longer be around by the time India becomes a permanent member of the UN Security Council. I do hope you are uh, alive and are able to watch it because it will be a very, very important uh, juncture in India's uh, growth and development and history. So thank you, Gautam. I'm sorry, so we'll have to, you know, we're running out of time. Uh, but he has promised in, to, to make himself available. So this is, of course, not the last opportunity for us to ask questions to uh, Gautam. See, I've proved to you that politics is more interesting than economics. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, a diplomat never says no. But it <laughs> doesn't always mean yes. But anyway. Uh, but uh, this concludes the Q&A part of the talk and uh, we are going to be now uh, nearing the completion. I'm going to hand it back to Jaleen. And uh, before I go back, uh, I would like you to show us uh, your appreciation with a good, good applause. To the speaker. And I request a guest of honor, Dr. Meera Dabashi, to deliver the word of thanks. Ajit Ranade, Vice Chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I go on with the vote of thanks, may I request uh, Chief Guest to do the honors? At the outset, let me profusely thank Ambassador Gautam Bambavale for his very excellent delivery of the 13th Dr. P. R. Dubashi public lecture on India and the emerging world order. It has been a very, very interesting talk and a very, uh, uh, which has been, uh, many of you have been on, uh, question, uh, raise so many questions and a uh, lot of interactions. A very erudite representation and perspective 
from different angles. In fact, my brother was very, very excited when uh, I told him about our speaker and the topic, and I'm sure that he would be uh, hearing it on the YouTube uh, since we are live streaming it. Um, my father also would have been very interested with this topic, and uh, uh, especially uh, when he joined uh, uh, the service, and it was just uh, soon after India got its uh, independence, and uh, all these young officers, as he was saying, we were all, uh, uh, you know, encouraged and inspired by this development work and so on. But the, uh, the uh, memory of the Indochina War was uh, not too far away, and uh, he would often say that, you know, we should build stronger ties with our neighbors, as our speaker said, rightly. And uh, so, uh, and, and also he would ask, why not if Germans could break and come together, why not India and Pakistan? You know, we have shared a similar culture and history and so on. But of course, as he said, it's a different thing. If it is a democracy, things would have been much better. Maybe that could have been possible. So I'll uh, thank you very much, uh, Gautam, for your very excellent uh, uh, talk. And uh, we have had, uh, a bit, uh, you know, from the number of questions that were raised, we had a very good interaction. Thank you, all of you. I would all, I'm also, I would also like to share a small family connection. Um, when my father would come to uh, uh, visit ADB or for his AD, uh, visit Manila for on an ADB assignment, uh, we would meet the Bambavales and uh, he was your uncle. Uh, and uh, I was there as on a CEDA project at the Asian Institute of Management and uh, I would also had a chance to meet them. So uh, it's really very nice that we could, you know, after all these years, uh, and now since you're uh, settled in uh, Pune, I hope to have more uh, connections and, uh, you know, relations and uh, association with you. I'm also very extremely thankful to Dr. Ajit Ranade for having uh, uh, organized this lecture within a very short period of his taking over as the reins of this renowned institute. We were trying to, uh, uh, we had suggested that uh, it should, you know, uh, be on the 70, we were trying to get that date. But uh, what is more significant that in spite of his various engagements, uh, we could push through and we could have this uh, 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 lecture in the, very, in the month of March since, um, uh, on January 7th, it would have been the 92nd birth anniversary of my father. So it was, thank you, sir, very much for uh, your all uh, your pains and efforts that you have taken to do this. And uh, it's a, it, it is a coincidence that uh, my father was born in the same year that this institute was established. So uh, he was educated in Pune, and uh, he would attend all the talks of uh, the you know political and literary figures uh, during that time, and the famous Pune's Vasantya uh, Vyakhyan Mala, and so on. So after his retirement from um, uh, the Indian Administrative Service and as Vice Chancellor Goa University, when he settled in Pune, uh, he thought, why not have some, you know, uh, an annual public lecture where uh, public thought can be mobilized and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, there could be uh, uh, some kind of um, an exchange and uh, people can interact and there can be more awareness. Like today we have had such a wonderful topic and, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, our uh, thoughts have been uh, awakened and uh, so uh, uh, since uh, 2005, when this idea was mooted, 
uh, we have been uh, having these uh, lectures almost every year except for the last two years. Uh, on 31st August 2020, uh, he passed and uh, the next year, uh, 13th September, my mother passed. So it was a very difficult uh, time for us, both of us. But uh, we hope to uh, continue with his lectures as per his wish. And, uh, I'm very, very thankful for Oakley Institute to um, have been, you know, doing it uh, all these years and continue to do so, especially uh, uh, since the institute is also uh, approaching its centenary years. La, uh, I would also, I'm very also happy that uh, this year we are live streaming it on the request of uh, family and uh, friends. Last but not the least, I would uh, extend my deep thanks to all the faculty, uh, Professor Pachure, who has uh, always, uh, you know, uh, supported this uh, lecture when uh, during the past few years, and all the supporting staff and uh, Meher, who has been messaging me and updating me always on organizing uh, and the arrangements made here. I would also thank all of you, all of you in the audience who are present here, who have actively taken part in this discussion, raising your questions and uh, having answered them uh, by a speaker. I hope that you will continue to give us support in the uh, future years too. And uh, if you have any suggestions, they are all very welcome. Please do email, you can email it to me or uh, you know drop it here at the Gokhale Institute. I think that we can do the same. So thank you very very much for being here once again. Thank. You. So I think that, that concludes the uh, Dr. Dubarshi Memorial, uh, the uh, public lecture. And uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Mehla Dubarshi, for the great uh, generous gesture and continuing this tradition. Incidentally, it was not only live stream, but I think it will also be permanently on YouTube now. So that's another good thing. And uh, I also will join her uh, in thanking everybody, including there are a lot of many, many unseen supporters, you know from the administration section, from the IT section, and you know, uh, uh, sound system. And actually, this is one of the first big events I think we're having uh, post-pandemic. So thank you for kicking off, and we hope this tradition will continue of having uh, a continuous lecture series of uh, various kinds, various topics. So thank you. So we'll conclude, and please join us for uh, tea and refreshments outside. Thank you again. Thank you.